Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And welcome to The Vine, the online campus of the Wrightsville United Methodist Church in Wrightsville Beach, North Carolina. I'm Pastor David Haley, the Associate Pastor for Visitation here at the church. It's my joy to welcome you to this online service. You know, we don't believe that anyone is watching this service by accident. We believe that you're watching this service because God has invited you, because God has a word for you. And that word may come through the sermon, may come through the children's sermon, may come through some of the music or the prayers or the scripture reading, but God has a word for you today. Let us now prepare our hearts and minds for worship. I invite you to join me now in praying together our opening congregational prayer. Uh, you'll find the words to the prayer on the video screen. Let us pray. Lord of life, by submitting to death, you conquered the grave. By being raised on a cross, you draw all peoples to you. By being raised from the dead, you restored to humanity all that we had lost through sin. Throughout these 50 days of Easter, we proclaim the marvelous mystery of your death and resurrection. For all praise is yours, now and forever. Amen. Now we come to the time in our service where uh, we affirm our common faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we usually use one of the traditional historical affirmations of faith. But today is Confirmation Sunday in our church. At our 1115 service, we'll be confirming 24 young people who have been in classes since last fall. And we have prepared a special affirmation of faith from our confirmation class. Uh, the students have expressed uh, in what they consider to be important parts and aspects of their faith. And these have been assembled into an affirmation of faith. Uh, the words will be on the screen for you to say along with us. So now let us affirm our faith. I believe in God who created me to be my beautiful self. I believe God is welcoming of everyone. And you can connect with God anywhere. You can always pray to God. We should trust God for He is here for us and is always looking out for us. God will guide us throughout our lives and I believe that God always has a place for us in heaven. I believe that Jesus loves us unconditionally, that He loves us even in our troubling times and would do anything to bring us into the light with Him. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for the forgiveness of sins, and that He is my Savior. I believe that everyone can be good. We should be kind to everyone, no matter what. We should stay faithful, even when times are tough. We should help others and spread the gospel. I believe that science and religion don't conflict with each other, that the church is not just a building, but the people, and that being a Christian means seeing the possibilities in something or someone. Amen.
Pastor Julia Hayes. I'm one of the associate pastors here, and it's my joy to get to lead us in prayer today. Please join me now as we pray together. Holy and loving God, we thank you for gathering us together today. We thank you that even when we are physically apart, your spirit can unite us. We thank you for the promise that whenever two or three are gathered in your name, you are here in our midst. Jesus, we thank you that you did not leave us as orphans, but that as you promised, you have sent us the advocate, the Holy Spirit, to constantly remind us all you taught us. We thank you for the peace that comes from the Holy Spirit that can live in us even when the world feels too hard to bear. Holy Spirit, we ask that you move in our lives. Even now, we ask that you fill us up let us feel your presence here with us. Jesus, as we wait for your return, there is so much brokenness in the world. We are longing for you to come and set all things right, to finally reconcile all things to yourself. As we await that day, we pray for the world. We pray especially for our community of Wrightsville Beach and Wilmington. We pray for all nations and peoples in strife, for the poor and victims of injustice. We pray for the church across the world, especially those who have to worship in hiding. We pray for the United Methodist Church and for this congregation of Wrightsville United Methodist Church. We pray for the sick and the dying and for all those that we name before you now, either out loud or in our hearts. Jesus, we thank you for the charge you gave us when you ascended, that we must make disciples as we go through the world, teaching them to do everything you taught us. We thank you that you have made us co-laborers in the healing of the world. Send us out to do your will, secure in the promise that the work is already finished. We ask all this in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we transition now into a time of reflection and giving, I'd like to remind you that you can always give to the Ministry of Wrightsville United Methodist Church through our website, wrightsvilleumc.org, our smartphone app, and of course, the mail. Let us now continue to worship God. kids. I'm Pastor Julia. I'm wondering, is there anything that you can do now that you used to need help with? Maybe there's something that you're tall enough to reach now or something else that you can do. There's a couple of things that I was thinking about that we have to learn to do for ourselves that before someone else needed to help us with. Like Tying a shoe. Do you know how to tie a shoe? It took me a little bit to figure that one out. Or what about writing your name? Can you write your name or do you need a friend to help you with that still right now? Or maybe even something like getting yourself a snack or making yourself breakfast. There's lots of things that we need help with at first, and then somebody else teaches us how to do. But until we can do it for ourselves, lots of people who love us do it for us. Well, today something really exciting is happening at church that I want to tell you about. 
it's something called confirmation. Confirmation usually happens inside the church when you're maybe 12 years old. And what happens is that when you're born, usually, you are baptized. And when you're baptized, the, your parents make promises on your behalf. So they say that they believe in God, they trust in Jesus, and they don't want anything to do with all of the bad, hard stuff in life. But instead, they know that Jesus will help them to get through all of it. And they make all of these promises for you. Because when you're a little baby, you can't make those promises for yourself yet. Just like you can't tie your own shoes and you can't get your own snack and you don't know how to write your name. Well, confirmation is when you are big enough to do all of those things. And that's the time when everyone who was baptized gets to decide that they believe those things too. So I hope that when you see people getting confirmed, you get excited for when it's your turn to do that too. Because there's nothing wrong with not being ready for something yet. We know that God will carry us through. Let's pray together now. God, thank you that you are with us all throughout our lives. Thank you for the people who help us with things when we're too little to do them for ourselves. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning and grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My name is Doug Lane. I'm senior pastor here at Wrightsville United Methodist Church, and I'm glad that you've taken time to spend a little, a little time with us today um, in worship as uh, we give thanks to God and honor and, and glorify Him. And in the midst of our service today, um, it's a, a little bit unusual in that uh, what's going to happen on uh, Sunday morning is we're going to be confirming 24 young people um, into the life of the church. And so these are 7th, 8th, 9th graders who are making their profession of faith. And my sermon today is really kind of geared toward them. But I, I, think, I think there's something in here for everybody. So I hope you don't turn it off. Um, I think there's a, there's a good message for all Christians in today's sermon. Our scripture for today comes from the book of Acts. We're looking at the very first chapter and the very first verse. Um, you may know this already, but the book of Acts is kind of a sequel to the Gospel of Luke. Luke is the author of both books, and, uh, and so he uh, opens up uh, this second book about the disciples' lives after Jesus has gone um, with, um, with these words. So let's, let's listen in on what um, Luke has to say. He says, in the first book, Theophilus, this is the person he's writing to, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day when he was taken up into heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you've heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they'd come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, it's not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus, who's been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Holy and gracious God, we thank you that um, you have sent your son Jesus um, to this world and uh, to save the world. 
and also that you have invited each of us to follow in his footsteps, not simply to watch what he does, but to do what he does. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Sam Jones was a Methodist minister in Georgia back in the 1800s. And he was famous for hosting revivals that he called quitting meetings. These meetings were to get people to confess their sins like cussing and drinking and gambling and so on. And then he'd have everyone pledge to quit those particular sins. And at one of these meetings, a lady was asked what she was going to quit. And she said she hadn't been doing anything and she was going to quit doing that. <laughs> Perhaps it's time for us to quit doing nothing. One of the oldest tricks in the book for mischief-minded big city kids is to stand out on a street corner and crane your neck toward the sky as if there is some sort of odd phenomenon happening above you and then look to see how many people will start looking up with you. It's really a temptation that's almost irresistible. When you start seeing people look up, you're going to look up. Well, this week we celebrate Jesus going up into heaven commonly known in church circles as the Ascension of the Lord, which took place 40 days after his resurrection. And there are the disciples standing around doing nothing except craning their necks toward the sky, looking up at Jesus as he mysteriously flies up into the clouds. What were the disciples feeling as they looked up at Jesus ascending into heaven? Did they wonder what he saw? Looking out, looking down, looking up. There, he's gone from us, they must have wondered. Our leader, our mentor, the power of God among us. Now what are we supposed to do? We can write the Gospels, but that's living in the past. We're looking up, but how can we look ahead? What does the future hold for us without our leader? Do we just stand around, looking up, waiting to see who's going to look up with us? To see what it is that has our attention on the sky instead of our feet on the ground? The disciples were probably feeling a little adventurous and a little bit hopeless all at the same time. Well, coming back to the 21st century, schools are getting out now. High schools and colleges are holding graduation ceremonies. But they don't always call it that. Sometimes they call those ceremonies commencement. Because you never really graduate from learning or from life. You commence, you begin a new phase. That's similar to confirmation. It isn't a graduation, it's a commencement toward a new phase in life. It's exhilarating, but it's also a little scary. The security of the past, of your childhood, is behind you, but the possibilities of the future are all out in front of you can fill that void with unlimited potential. The first disciples, of course, were not graduating from school, but they did have similar feelings of dislocation. They asked one of the oldest and most deeply religious questions in the world. What now? A two-word question that's not only curious about the future, but wonders if there'll even be a future. What now? Now that we're all grown up, what now? Think of all the times in life when this is the most appropriate question to be asked. I made a decision to follow Christ at my confirmation, so what now? I've graduated from high school or college, what now? I'm married, what now? I got a job, what now? I built my dream home, what now? I'm finally retired, what now? Why do, you look standing, why do you stand looking up into the sky? The two men dressed in white addressed the disciples. On the one hand, this passage says Jesus is still among us and will be until the end of time and sends up his power among us through the Holy Spirit. But on the other hand, it asks, why are you just standing there? There's discipling that needs to be done. You've been given the experience of the living Lord and the power of the Holy Spirit for a purpose. His purpose. And that purpose is to build the worldwide, ages-wide church of Jesus Christ. If all you do is look up in the sky and wonder, what next? Well, you're kind of getting a free ride. 
Now this may seem like a big job to put on the shoulders of 12, 13, and 14 year olds because I know it's a big job to put on 40, 60, and 80 year olds. But the job is now ours to help build up the church. We learned on the first day of confirmation class that there are three types of people in Jesus' day. There was the crowd, the Pharisees, and the disciples. Those same three groups exist today. We can go along with the crowd, or we can choose to be judgmental disciples, excuse me, excuse me, judgmental Pharisees. But Jesus asks us to be disciples who follow him and offer faith, hope, and love to the world. But we can't just stand around looking at Jesus. He expects us to take on the task of discipling others. Well, I've used this next illustration before, but I think it's worth sharing with you all today. So if you'll bear with me, um, and maybe it's true that you haven't even heard this, but uh, I think it certainly goes well with today's text. You see, back uh, when the West was being settled, the major means of transportation was the stagecoach. You've seen passengers riding stagecoaches in old Western movies. What you might not know is that the stagecoach had three different types of tickets. First class, second class, and third class. And if you had a first class ticket, that meant you could remain seated during the entire trip no matter what happened. If the stagecoach got stuck in the mud or had trouble making it up a steep hill, or even if a wheel fell off, you could remain seated because you had a first class ticket. If you had a second class ticket, you also could remain seated until there was a problem. In case of a problem, second class ticket holders would have to get off until the problem was resolved. You could stand off to the side and watch as other people worked. You didn't actually have to get your hands dirty, but second class ticket holders were not allowed to stay on board. When the stagecoach was unstuck, you get back on and take your seat. But if you had a third class ticket, you would definitely have to get off if there was a problem. Why? Because it was your responsibility to help solve the problem. You had to get out and push or help lift to fix a broken wheel or whatever was needed because you only had a third class ticket. That's what the church needs. Christians with third class tickets who are willing to roll up their sleeves and get the job done for the sake of Jesus Christ. I find it very interesting that the name of the book of the Bible that we read from today is called Acts. Actions, deeds, doings, the acts of the apostles. These disciples didn't end up standing around for long, and neither should we. Isn't it time we quit doing nothing? It's actually easier than you think, because we have what people are looking for most in this world. Numerous studies and statistics tell us that what most people are looking for are three things in life. Number one, they're looking for meaning and purpose. Looking for something that will make their life count. Looking for a life that will make a difference in the world. In the face of frustration and turmoil, in a world of violence where human life seems so cheap, in a world where all too often the value of a person's life is measured by what they make rather than who they are, People are looking for meaning, purpose, a way to make a life. Jesus says, you will be my witnesses in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. He offers a purpose worth dying for, a vision worth living for, to live out the unfinished work of Jesus, to be his witnesses in this world. So if you're looking for meaning and purpose, you will find it in the service of Jesus Christ. Number two, people are looking for relationships. Meaningful, loving, lasting relationships. Waylon Jennings is an old country singer who probably said it best. He said, we're looking for love in all the wrong places. Luke says all the disciples returned to Jerusalem. There was Peter and John and James and Andrew. Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, Simon, Judas, the son of James, Mary and Jesus' brothers and all the other women. In one accord, one place, all together. The message translation of the Bible says they agreed they were all in this for good, completely together in prayer, women included. 
Don't you wish we had a verbatim record of what happened back in those days? Wouldn't it be great to hear all of Jesus' friends and family retelling the stories of how they spent time with him? There must have been laughter and joy and certainly tears and remembrance. And if the rest of the New Testament's any indication, there was probably some bickering and some nitpicking, some jockeying for power, some jealousy. They were fearful and fretful, but also delighted. They were probably depressed, doubting, grieving the past, but also dreaming about the future. It was all there. But through it all, there was also anticipation and joy and great hope because that's the church. Which brings us to the third people, third thing people are looking for, and that's power. Power for living. And I don't mean political power, or economic power, or military power. I'm not talking about that kind of power. I think people are looking for the strength to get through the day, confidence for the journey, courage to face life's uncertainties. People are looking for an energizing, life-giving power for living out the daily routines of our lives. Well, Jesus gives us the promise, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Power for living, confidence in the face of uncertainty, hope in the face of loss, assurance in times of fear, You know, every time we celebrate a baptism, we acknowledge the spiritual forces of wickedness and the evil powers of this world. But in response, we boldly proclaim the freedom and power that God gives us to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves. So we are in essence saying, yes, there is evil in this world. There is wickedness, and it is all too present. But that is not the full story. For in Christ there is freedom and power to overcome. There is power for living. There's an old gospel song that says it well. It says there's power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There's power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. And people are responding to that power. Just this week, I mean just this week, People in this church offered to use their professional gifts to help upfit the Oleander property to make it more usable for youth. Someone else made a generous financial donation toward our youth program. Someone came into the church asking what they could do to help and they left with names and numbers of our homebound members to call from home. People came in and cooked a meal for our confirmands and their families. Others stuffed the bulletins with the inserts that announce all the ministries that are happening here. Someone else came in to clean up the sanctuary. They straightened up the hymnals. They threw away the bulletins that were left over from the week before. People volunteered to teach Sunday school and lead classes and give food to Mother Hubbard's cupboard and make flower arrangements. And they served as ushers and greeters and acolytes and so much more. All that happened this week. The Church of Jesus Christ offers what people are looking for most in this world. And we are the ones to offer those things to the ones around us. So I invite you today to claim Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And then add your name to those who are willing to punch their third class ticket. So that we might serve him best in this world. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Holy and loving God. Lord, we are in awe of you. We see all that you are doing, and we just want to get on board. Lord, help us to follow your son, Jesus Christ. In the good days and in the bad days, you still give us meaning and purpose, loving relationship, and power to get through our days. Lord, Help us to move boldly and confidently into tomorrow. For we can't wait to see what's next. In Jesus' name, amen. Today is an exciting day in the church. Right here at this kneeler, uh, 24 kids are going to...
profess our faith in Christ and say, I do to Jesus. It's so cool. And uh, I hope that you will too. Wherever you are watching this video, that you'll say yes to Jesus. That you'll take him as your Lord and Savior. And that uh, you too, wherever you are, will help spread the good news about Jesus Christ and what he has to offer to this world. Go forth in faith. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. May the road rise to meet you. May the wind blow at your back. May the sun shine warmly on your face. Thank you.